The psalmist wrote this in Psalm 84, 5. Blessed are those whose strength is in the Lord, who have their hearts set on pilgrimage. 400 years ago, a small group of Christians whose hearts were set on pilgrimage lived and worshipped in the town of Scrooby in Yorkshire, England. They had no church building, but they held secret meetings in the manor house at Scrooby owned by the Archbishop of York. The manor was also occupying a stu stu I'm sorry, I'm tongue tied. <laughs> Wake up, tongue. <laughs> a strategic spot on the Great North Road from London to Scotland. And it was the location of the Royal Post Office, which was the depot for communications across the east part of England and where fresh horses were available to the post riders who served the crown. And the postmaster was William Brewster. Now this little church was led by the reverends Richard Clifton and John Robinson. And these Christians were called separatists because they had separated themselves from the state church of England. They no longer enjoyed the freedom to worship openly. And they were, turned, they were vulnerable to the law and to other Christians who rooted them out and turned them over to the authorities for arrest. They lived in daily fear in a Christian country from other Christians. Their beliefs caused them to become outcasts because they rejected the authority of the Church of England, taking the Bible as their supreme authority in matters of faith and practice. And they claimed that neither a building, nor the king, nor the Anglican clergy defined the church, but that the church existed wherever two or three believers were gathered together in Christ's name. They rejected the divisions between clergy and congregation, and they shared equally in the privileges and duties of church governance as a priesthood of all believers. In a country where every citizen was part of the state church, their beliefs were radical and seditious, threatening the very foundations of the English government and putting them in jeopardy of economic deprivation, arrest, imprisonment, and even a death sentence. But even so, their concern was not for government nor ecclesiastical politics, but for the love of Christ and the message of the gospel. And so in 1606, under the guiding hands of John Robinson and William Brewster, the Scrooby Church Congregation organized itself through the owning of a covenant, the age-old form of the sacred promises which God began with. He began with the father of faith, Abraham, and then beyond through the whole Bible. And these are the words of the covenant with God that they wrote that day. As the Lord's free people, we join ourselves by a covenant of the Lord into a church estate, in the fellowship of the gospel, to walk in all his ways made known or to be made known to us, according to our best endeavors, whatsoever it should cost us, the Lord assisting us. Mm -hmm. Now like Father Abraham, when he began his pilgrimage with God to leave his people and his country and go to a land that God would show them, the church at Scrooby would go first to Holland in 1607, where there was freedom to practice their faith and ultimately, in 1620, like Father Abraham, they went to an unknown land. And with them, they carried in their hearts the covenant they made with God and each other, whatsoever it should cost them. As they sailed from England's shore to the New World, William Bradford recorded the mood of their parting toward the end, parting from land and towards the land of God's promise. This is what he said. They knew they were pilgrims, and looked not much on these things, but lifted up their eyes to the heavens, their dearest country, and quieted their spirits. Even as England disappeared from their sight, they knew that no matter where on earth God led them, they already had a home in heaven. And even as they embarked into the great earthly unknown, their spirits were comforted and quieted for they had already found rest in God's promise. 
They earned this name pilgrim because of the holy nature of their journey, a pilgrimage to a holy place where they could meet and live with God. Though Bradford used this term in his history of Plymouth Plantation, it wasn't until 1820 when Daniel Webster used the name pilgrims in his 200th anniversary to the town, addressed to the town of Plymouth, that this word passed into common usage and has been ever since. Now from the start, the success of their journey was far from certain. Two ships left England in July of 1620, but the speedwell was leaking, and so it had to be returning to port and then sold, and it left only the Mayflower to transport a part of the pilgrims that wanted to come here, 102 passengers, plus supplies to the New World in September of 1620. And the voyage was plagued with strong winds and storms. Halfway across the Atlantic, the main mast cracked, and the pilgrims had to consider whether to turn back to England or to go on. Two men died during the voyage, and when the Mayflower reached land in November, it was only after several days of coastal navigation that a sheltered harbor was located by what is now Provincetown. William Brewster, at that place, led the people in a prayer of thanksgiving as they said together Psalm 100, which we just said together as our call to worship. Winter set in with ice and snow, and by December most of the passengers and the crew were sick with colds and flu and suffering from scurvy and exposure. By the end of that winter, half of those who had traveled to the New World on the Mayflower were dead. That first year, the pilgrims dug more graves for the dead than foundations for homes for the living. What was it that kept them going? What was more important to them than life itself? That they would risk their lives and the lives of their children to pursue it, surely knowing that the perils that they put themselves in to do this thing. When I think of our pilgrim ancestors, I'm reminded of another person, another pilgrim, who risked everything for the same reason. And that was the Apostle Paul. I want you to listen to his personal history that he wrote in various parts of his letter to Corinth. He said, we do not want you to be uninformed brothers about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts we felt the sentence of death. But this happened, that we might not rely on ourselves but on God, who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we set our hope, that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and the day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in the danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face the daily pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. 
for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I don't know of anyone save the Lord Jesus Christ himself who suffered more greatly than the Apostle Paul. Flogged, beaten, stoned, shipwrecked three times, surviving a night and day in the open sea. Sleep deprived, hungry, cold, naked, under threat of death again and again and again. And what did he have to say about all of that? Though he felt the pressure of suffering far beyond his ability to endure, even preferring at times the prospect of death itself to release him from it, Paul came to see his suffering in a wider vision for a greater purpose. His suffering he saw happen so that he would not rely on himself but on God alone. Suffering that he could not control or handle threw him continuously back into the arms of God, who has control and power over all. And so Paul escaped all of these perils. And it was in his deliverance that he found his hope. At one point he received what he called this thorn in the flesh, a constant reminder of his flawed mortality which would not be taken away. But even this he saw as God's providence because it reminded him of his own weakness and God's eternal strength. And he found this great paradox which became a lifeline to him. It was in his weakness that God's power was strongest. God could be God in his life because Paul was weak. And in that weakness, Paul found God's grace. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. It was God's grace that sustained the Apostle Paul to the end. And it was God's grace through which Paul established the early churches, our long ago ancestors of faith. And I think it was this same grace that the pilgrims found, though half of them did die that first winter. Their death, pure and unfettered in the arms of their God, was preferable to a life in England where they would not be able to worship him. Death, in a way, was an ultimate reward. Their transport to the final new world of heaven, where they would live with God forever. But we know that wasn't the end of their story, because half of them did live. The hardship known at first would lessen in the coming year. That following December 1621, Edward Winslow wrote of that first feast of Thanksgiving, we sat last spring some 20 acres of Indian corn and sowed some six acres of barley and peas. And according to the manner of the Indians, we manured our ground with herrings. Our corn did prove well, and God be praised, we had a good increase of Indian corn. And our harvest being gotten in, our governor sent four men on fowling so that we might, after a more special manner, rejoice together after we had gathered the fruit of our labors. So they four in one day killed as much fowl as served our company for almost a week, at which time amongst our recreations we exercised our arms. And many Indians came amongst us, some 90 men, and their greatest king, Massasoit, whom for three days we entertained and feasted. And they went out and killed five deer which they brought back to the plantation. And although it may not always be so plentiful as it was at this time with us. Yet by the goodness of God, we are so far from want that we often wish you partakers of our plenty. Winslow's words prove that God's grace was sufficient for the pilgrims. I thank God that he left of Plymouth Plantation. We wouldn't know the half of what we know. That first Thanksgiving saw twice as many guests in the form of native peoples who had befriended the pilgrims. God's grace. 
a native who talks at man named Squanto, by God's grace, had been to England and back several years before the pilgrims landed. He spoke English. He knew about the Englishman's God. He became a special friend and interpreter for them because he was influential with the peoples around and he knew English and their languages. And the native peoples showed the pilgrims how to farm in this unique way, in this new land, and where they could find the best hunting. God's grace. God's grace was sufficient for the pilgrims. In their weakness, God did not disappoint them. His strength gave them hope and a future. And this is the grace of thanksgiving. It's God's unfailing love and the provision for those who love him. It was God's grace which propelled the pilgrims across the Atlantic, and they not only survived in a new land, but they thrived so magnificently that a new nation, by God's grace, was born. When we sit down to our tables this Thanksgiving to celebrate, it is by God's grace. And as we say grace, May our grace be permeated with thanksgiving for our gracious and loving God. I can think of no greater grace saying than Psalm 118. This was the final Hallel Psalm. There were six of them that our Jewish ancestors of faith sang as they approached the Temple Mount during Hanukkah, which is their celebration of thanksgiving for God's faithfulness and provision for his people. And the psalm begins and ends with a festal shout of thanksgiving to the Lord. I'm going to read a portion of that now, and I want that to be our prayer for today. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Open for me the gates of righteousness, and I will enter in and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done this this very day, so let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. Grant us your success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Today is Thanksgiving Sunday. Let us reflect upon what God has done for us out of his love and goodness and let us give generously of ourselves and our resources for the building of his kingdom here in Plymouth that he began 400 years ago. Will the deacons come forward to collect the offer?